Good morning, it's Reverend Mike Capron. Uh, we're doing a series this Lent on the cross. Um, and this morning we're going to look at some Bible texts and have a little discussion about what's often called the atonement. The notion that on the cross Jesus was the sacrifice that took the penalty for our sins. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of texts from Romans and go on from there. This is Romans 3, 24 to 26. All are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies who, those who have faith in Jesus. And then chapter 4, 23 to 25. The words, it, faith, was credited to him, were written not for Abraham alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. I'd now like to uh, read a little account of uh, uh, some kind of a camp meeting that uh, author Andrew Root was at, and um, which discusses the atonement and consider what's good and what's not good about this description. I guess it was supposed to be good news, but it didn't feel like it. The camp speaker said to us kids, if God were really to see you, all God would see is your sin, and sin disgusts God, because God is holy and completely righteous. And you're not, are you? You kids know that in so many ways you all suck, right? I mean, I suck too. But here's the thing, when God looks at you, God doesn't see you at all. Rather, all God sees when God looks at you is Jesus, and Jesus was sinless and righteous. God has these Jesus glasses on that mean whenever God looks at us, God sees Jesus. And now we are righteous because Jesus is sinless. And here is the better news. Jesus died on the cross, so God will wear these Jesus glasses forevermore. You deserve punishment, but Jesus' death has justified you. And here's even better news. You don't have to do anything but accept this. This has been done for you. God has declared that you are justified. Afterward, we sat in our cabin with our counselor unpacking what the words of the speaker meant in our lives. We were told it's not like deserving an A, but being given an A anyhow, because Jesus had taken the test for us. Well, we all agreed that was pretty good, except that, of course, in the context of the analogy, none of us were transformed through the learning process. Our substitute test taker left us with good marks, but ignorant. It was assumed that the point of life was to get the grade, not to participate in something beyond ourselves. End of quote from Dr. Root. So, this is tricky to do with the online version of this sermon, because what I'm going to do at this point in our sanctuary is to have kind of an open discussion as people talk about this. Um, but I'll do the best I can to just relay a few points to you folks. Um, the, you know, there, there are some things that are technically true about this, um, some, some doctrine that is correctly conveyed, but the way it is conveyed is counterproductive in a whole variety of ways. Um, first of all, uh, anything that leads us to believe that God might hate us or um, to cause us to hate ourselves is probably counterproductive to the life of faith. Um, it is true that it's helpful for us to be personally convicted of our sin and to repent of it and to change our ways. Um, and it is true that we're all affected by sin 
uh, whether we want to be or not, because it's way bigger than we are, uh, and it's far older than we are. Um, but it is important to remember that we are made in God's image, and God's primary motivation is to love us. Um, and so, yes, God takes sin seriously, and there's a consistency that's implied by the doctrine of atonement that God uh, does take justice seriously, which means punishing sin. Um, and it's beautiful that Jesus loved us enough to go to the cross for our sake um, and kind of handle that situation. Um, but, you know, the... The, the way this is presented in that story is, I think, a, an example of, of really a, a, the, the means of communication sort of negating the beauty of the message. The other thing we have to say is that we Presbyterians have always emphasized that being justified, um, not taking the penalty for our sins, is only the first step then the process of sanctification begins in our lives. And then uh, we can really begin to live the Christian life, which is not about having a grade or about going to heaven after death, but about uh, loving our neighbor and um, you know, serving Christ in this life. We are elected and justified for service and to show love to other people in the world. So that's the... That's the narrative. That's my response to the narrative. Um, and uh, I'm going to make this a little brief this morning for you online folks. I'm going to read one more text from Romans uh, where Paul, you know, kind of is, is he's been building this case for five chapters, um, explaining about justification and how we realize through faith that we have been justified and we begin to have some gratitude toward God. And that's exactly the moment that he jumps in on Romans 6, 1 through 11. So I'm going to paraphrase a little to get us into this, but he says, okay, so we've been justified by Jesus' death on the cross. Uh, shall we just go on sinning that grace may increase, right? Like if I sin more, there'll be more grace. And uh, that's great, right? By no means, starts verse 2. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. As Christians, we have new life, truer life, better life. Um, we're actually freer to be who, who we, we really are. Verse 5. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. That's the condition of being in sin. It's actually bondage to all manner of, of habits, addictions, uh, evil stuff, patterns that we fall into that we may have learned from our culture or our parents or, or choices that we make, or it's probably kind of both somehow. It's a perpetuating cycle but we're enslaved to sin and we're being offered this freedom. Verse 7, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again, since death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. My friends, that's the good news. Um, I hope I've managed to convey some of these complex things in a, in a brief way. As always, I would love to talk to anybody who 
uh, hears this and wants to uh, to check in about it, uh, leave a comment um, or uh, or private message me or call me if you know me and and um, happy to discuss these matters. And may God bless you this day, this week, or whenever you see this.